Hello again! This is my third video response to Feminist Frequencies Tropes vs. Women series. But before I get into that, I want to respond to some comments that have been made regarding the previous two videos. First, the most common question I get is, you say you're a veteran game developer, so what games have you worked on? Fair enough. Now, not every game that I've worked on got published. Some were killed during development. But here is a list of the ones that actually made it to the store shelves. You'll note that the last four were all for Disney's Infinity. Which brings me to the second question I get. Anita has been making her Tropes vs. Women series for something like four years. Why haven't you said anything before now? A good question. And, simply put, like any major video game publisher, Disney specifically asked their development teams not to court controversy. They have PR teams to deal with that sort of thing. Plus, as far as I know, Anita has never called out Disney Infinity. So, speaking up as a developer in defense of a game like Grand Theft Auto V might not have been exactly well received by my previous employer. If anything, it probably would have landed me in the Human Resources Department, where I'm sure I would have heard the message of, Disney is making family-friendly games. Let the publishers making the M-rated titles deal with their own press. So, to put it in game terms, the risk just wasn't worth the reward. Ah, uh, but Disney shut down the Infinity franchise this past summer. That has freed me up now to pursue some of my own projects, like making YouTube videos, or self-publishing my own epic fantasy novels. So, even though I recognize I'm late to the party, better late than never, right? Finally, several commenters pointed out that in my problematic video, that my pie chart showing what percentage of the gaming industry is being targeted by Anita wasn't really a very good argument. After all, no one could possibly play all those games, so we really don't know how many she might find problematic. Well, I accept this criticism, and I recognize its validity. That being said, the point I was attempting to make, and apparently made poorly, was that irrespective of the actual numbers involved, the portion of published games that fall under the M-rated category for sexuality is relatively small. I probably should have either just used some counterexamples, or maybe I should have used a metaphor, something like uh, Anita's ideology is so constraining that she's like a blind man trying to describe an entire elephant by only touching its tail. Anyway, back to the fun. Okay, so a quick review of where we stand. Number one, Femfreak is pursuing an ideological agenda rather than engaging in well-rounded research. This badly skews both Miss Sarkeesian's representation of the game she reviews as well as the industry as a whole. Number two, Femfreak is focusing in on a tiny fraction of the video games that are being created and thereby misrepresents the scope of the alleged problem. And number three, there is very little genuine support for her thesis that video games are somehow making gamers sexist. To the contrary, just like the case with violence in video games, the preponderance of the available scientific evidence we have suggests that sexualized content in games is largely harmless. Okay, so where do we go from here? Well, at the end of both of those previous two videos, I tried to end them on an upbeat note by stating my personal bias. Games are the most egalitarian form of entertainment ever created. I think it's time I provided a bit of support for my position. So in this video, I'm hardly going to talk about feminist frequency at all. Which is nice, because I'm generally a pretty upbeat and optimistic guy, and all that negativity just wears you down. Now. Many other commentators have already called out that Anita seems to be largely ignoring the wide range of games that already feature strong female protagonists. You know, I really don't want to retread that ground. Others have already done a bang-up job on pointing out that, actually, there are a lot of powerful and respectable female protagonists out there in video game land. Instead, I want to approach this from a different angle which, I believe, makes my point of games being egalitarian even more convincingly than 
naming off a roster of strong female avatars. This is XCOM 2, and one of my all-time favorite games. I think it's smartly designed and beautifully executed. I've played it a lot, so much so that I even beat it on Commander Iron Man difficulty. The chief engineer on board your ship is named Lily Shen. She's pretty awesome and, I think, a good example of an important female character who isn't sexualized at all. I think even Femme Freak would have a difficult time finding anything objectionable about her. But even more telling than the presence of Dr. Shen are your soldiers that you used to fight against the alien overlords. Take a look. You'll note that the men and the women are functionally identical. They are perfect mirror images of one another. They have access to all the same skills, same abilities, same weapons, same upgrades, and the same armor. Heck, you could even change their gender from male to female and back again on the fly with no change in their capabilities. And it's the same thing regarding their race, age, or anything else. All physical changes are cosmetic and don't really matter to gameplay. Now, take a moment to think about this from a sociological standpoint and from within the context of the criticisms that are being leveled by gadflies like Arnita Sarkeesian. The foundational assumption of a game like XCOM 2 is one of complete and total equity between the sexes. Anything a white male soldier can do just as effectively can be done by, say, a Japanese female one. Everyone, black or white, Asian or Hispanic, male or female, they're all equally valuable and equally capable. You really can't get any more egalitarian than that. But XCOM 2 is in no way unique in this aspect. Nearly every video game that includes a significant character creation aspect does the same thing. In fact, I can't think of any that don't. They all treat men and women as equals. From World of Warcraft to Skyrim. From Dragon Age to The Sims. From Guild Wars to Fallout. From City of Heroes to Saints Row. From EVE Online to even WWE. We could go on and on here. The ability to make whatever character you want is one of people's favorite parts about many, many games. And underlying that creation rubric is an egalitarian ideology that is so commonplace it is taken for granted. Men and women are treated as transparently equivalent with all the same skills, rights, abilities, and opportunities. But it's not just limited to games featuring character creation. Most games that allow for any kind of choice in what character you can play go to great lengths to assure strict equity and balance between the sexes. In the strategy game Civilization VI, you've got female leaders from history that are just as powerful and influential as the male ones. In Overwatch, Farah can school you just as well as can McCree. In League of Legends, the female characters are just as likely to kick your butt as are any of the males. The same is true of all the Mortal Kombat games, or the Tekken games, or really any fighting game. In a tower defense game like Orcs Must Die, the sorceress clobbers the baddies just as well as the War Mage. In Hearthstone, the priestess Tyranda is just as powerful as the druid Malfurion. In Dead by Daylight, the nurse will kill you just as dead as will the hillbilly. And Dwight is just as likely to escape as is Claudette. Okay, maybe not really because everyone loves to hook Dwight and watch him bleed out. But, hopefully, you see my point here. Because of the importance of balance in game design, wherever there is a choice to be made regarding your character, Men and women are treated with strict equality in terms of their respective power and ability. Again, it's so commonplace that we take it for granted. If there's a choice of the character you can play in a game, 
you can bet that the male and the female options will be marvelously and beautifully equivalent. Furthermore, there is nothing new about this. It's been going on since as long as there have been character selection options in games. For example, here's the game Dungeon Master, published back in 1987, and one that used to keep me up all night when I was in college. Even here, Hulk the Barbarian is equal in potential to Sonya the Fighter. Games have been on board with the notion of equality and balance between the sexes for decades. The social justice warriors aren't leading some new charge towards equality and progressivism within gaming. Rather, they are playing catch-up. We gamers have been here all along. Okay, so one final note to wrap this all up and why this topic is so important. Anita consistently sends a message that male gamers and developers feel threatened and that they're trying to keep female gamers out. Women are perceived as threatening because we are asking for games to be more inclusive. We do have lots of different kinds of games. And so that, what are you complaining and about? And that's one of the things that I think is happening here is that we have this wide range of, of games that um, we're seeing mobile games, we're seeing indie games, we're seeing this influx of different kinds right. of games. They're actually responding to the fact that we're saying gaming can no longer be this little boys club anymore. That there are many of us who have been playing games our whole, many of us women who have been playing our games our whole lives. And so they're, they're lashing out because we're challenging the status quo of gaming as a male-dominated space. Well, can't, can't they have their own? It is this false narrative to which I most strongly object. Games have always aimed to be inclusive. They have always aimed for balance in their portrayal of men and women. If anything, games have been leading the way. Gender parity is a standard of game design. Over the years, games have grown and evolved from a tiny subculture to become mainstream entertainment. There are games now to suit every kind of interest or appetite. We should be celebrating this. But instead, we have Femme Freak propagating a message that women aren't really welcome in the gaming world. And that's both wrong and very discouraging. So, allow me, as a developer, to correct Anita's ideologically derived false narrative. Finally, if you feel so inclined that you want to work in game development, then please hear my words. You are welcome here. Don't let Anita's negative propaganda put you off. We need you. We need your talents and your perspectives. We need your insight and your abilities. Male or female, black or white, Indian or Australian, gay or straight, trans or cis, orc or troll, dwarf or elf, Asari or Turian, it doesn't matter. Everyone is welcome as part of the great gaming family. So join us. Please. Until next time, my friends, game on.